Um, let me give you a, an overview of what we hope to, to, to cover. First of all, whether you agree with this or not, there's no denying that the vast majority of, of news headlines and opinion concerning threats to freedom of thought and expression identify Islam as the key threat. So, is there anything distinctive about suppression of freedom of expression in Islamic states that isn't found elsewhere today? Or do all religions have the same potential for oppression uh, and bigotry? Maybe we are unfairly singling out Islam. Maybe such worries merely distract us from the more important current question, which there's no denying, which is why Islam uh, here and now is a source of such tension and violence, particularly pitting Muslim against Muslim, uh, as we see in the Middle East, countries like Syria, and, and the country of my birth, where I grew up in, in, in Iraq, uh, which is so sad to see. But is this sectarian conflict of Sunni versus Shia uh, something that maybe Europe suffered with, Protestants versus Catholics, and maybe that was a period that we have now come out of? Or is there, is, is there something specific about Islam? Of interest to me also are other issues, and, and I, I, I have at least two, two thirds of the current panelists are like me, I would regard as scientists. Um, so, is Islam especially averse to science? By science, I mean sort of the scientific method, rational thinking, despite the fact, and this is something I've written about, that a millennium ago, the Islamic empire was a beacon for rational enlightenment in science, in, in, while the West, where Western Europe was mired in the Dark Ages. Uh, and what about other issues, uh, Islam, current issues, Islam's attitude towards what we in the West hold dear, human rights, gender equality, democracy, or is this really all an Islamophobic misconception heavily distorted by our media, which seems to be obsessed with the extreme fringes of the Islamic world? These are the sorts of issues we want to be discussing, heavy stuff. Um, now, you will see in your um, programs that I should have been joined by four panelists. At the moment, we only have three. Um, so I, I will introduce them very, very briefly, and then I'll say something about them uh, in turn. So I'll, I'll start from, from my, uh, the, the nearest to me, Keenan Malik, writer and broadcaster. Uh, Mariam Namazi is political activist, campaigner and blogger. Uh, Alam Shaha is a science teacher, uh, filmmaker and writer. And we hope to be joined by Majid Nawaz, uh, who's the founder of the Kulium Foundation and co-founder of Kuli Pakistan, who is caught in traffic. Uh, we, hope, we hope he will be here. I'll leave him to, to do his bit at the very end uh, uh, so that uh, uh, he, has, he has time to make it. Um, okay, so randomly I've, I, I've thought about what will be the, the, the order, which is why I've, I've seated my panelists in this order. So the, the format is I'll, I'll introduce a little bit of biography for each of the panelists, say something about their life and work, and then give them eight to ten minutes to, to, to get a point of view across, something that they have pre-prepared. We'll run through the panel, then we'll open up Q&A for, uh, for, for the audience. So let me begin with Keenan Malik. Uh, Keenan's Indian-born English writer, lecturer, and broadcaster. He trained in neurobiology and the history of science. As a scientific author, his focus is on the philosophy of biology and contemporary theories of multiculturalism, pluralism, and race. Um, he has uh, campaigned for the defense, in defense of free speech, secularism, and scientific rationalism. He was one of the first left-wing critics of multiculturalism. He's opposed restrictions on hate speech, supported open-door policies on immigration, uh, he's a distinguished supporter of the British Humanist Association and a trustee of the free speech magazine Index on Censorship. His latest book, From Fatwa to Jihad, argues that the fatwa declared by Ayatollah Khomeini against Salman Rushdie's uh, Satanic Verses changed the Islamic landscape, as it, for the first time, extended the jurisdiction of a fatwa beyond national borders and transplanted it into the very heart of the Western world. He insists that the work was not an attack on Muslim cultural identity uh, and points out that most Muslims weren't offended by satanic verses. He claims that its main effect was to create a perception of the normalization of offense in Western political reactions to Islam, 
which has led to something we're all familiar with now, self-censorship. So first off, Keenan, uh, I guess you're expected to come up to the lectern, if that's all right with you. I'll, I'll hand over to, to you. Lectern. Thanks, Jim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be, to be speaking here. But I also have, I do have a, two books since I wrote. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, sorry. <laughs> um, um, Jim laid out a whole host of issues um, which were meant to address. I'm not going to address any of them. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, begin with talk about Muslims at all. Every year I give a lecture to a group of theology students who are actually trained to be Anglican priests at Trinity College at Bristol on why I am an atheist. And part of the talk is about values, and every year um, I get the same response from them, which is that without God, one can simply pick and choose which values one accepts and which one doesn't. And I say, that's true. I, I do pick and choose, but so do you. And I point out to, to the students that you know, the Bible sanctifies slavery, it commends the killing of adulterers, it commends the killing of witches, and so on. Few modern day Christians would accept such demands. But others, they would accept. In other words, they pick and choose. So do Muslims. Jihadi literalists, bridge builders, so called bridge builders like Tariq Ramadan, or uh, liberals like uh, Ashur Banji, all read the same Quran. And each reads it differently, each finding in it different views about women's rights or homosexuality or apostasy or free speech and so on. Each picks and chooses the values that they consider to be Islamic. Now, I'm making this point because it's a point not just for believers, but for humanists too, for atheists too. There's a tendency for atheists to read religions in Islam in particular, as literally often as fundamentalists do, to ignore the fact that what believers do is interpret the same text a hundred different ways. Different religions clearly have different theology, different beliefs, different values. Islam is different from Christianity, is different from Buddhism. But what is important is not simply the text, a particular holy text, a holy book, or a particular sacred text, say, but how people interpret the, those texts. And the relationship between religion, interpretation, identity, and politics can be quite complex, which is why, for instance, Today, Sri Lanka and Myanmar Buddhists, who many people, not least humanists, take these symbols of peace and harmony, are organizing vicious pogroms against Muslims. Pogroms led by monks who justify the violence using religious texts. Well, to put it another way, the point I'm trying to make is that significance of religion lies not so much in a set of values or beliefs, even though those are important, as in the insistence that such values or beliefs, whatever they are, are mandated by God. That's what gives those values power. That's what gives people power, the insistence that this set of values is mandated by God. Now, as humanists, we reject the idea of values as possessing divine mandate. But we should also recognize that within any faith, different people can hold different, indeed opposed values, and all claim that those values have been sanctioned by God. And I think it's in this context we need to think about whether there is something about Islam and what that is. There are a host of different views that Muslims hold on issues from apostasy to free speech, views that range from the liberal to the reactionary. The trouble is, that policy makers and journalists and liberals in general often take the most reactionary view to be the most authentic stance. I remember the Danish MP, um, Nasser Haddad, a Muslim, though not a particularly religious one, he was telling me about a, a conversation he had with um, the editor of Politik in a left-wing Danish newspaper, the uh, Danish version of The Guardian that had been highly critical of the Danish cartoons. And I had to recall it to this editor that he said to me that the cartoons insulted all Muslims. I said, I was not insulted. 
And the editor replied, but you're not a real Muslim. <laughs> you're not a real Muslim. Why? Because to be a proper Muslim, in, from such a perspective, is to be reactionary, to find the Danish cartoons offensive, to go burn uh, the satanic verses, and so on. Anyone who isn't reactionary or offended by, by, by the cartoons or by the satanic verses uh, or whatever is by definition not a proper Muslim. Once Muslims become defined like this, then liberal so-called anti-racism both plays into racist stereotypes of Muslim communities and becomes a vehicle for supporting reactionary conservative voices in those communities and marginalizing uh, the, the progressives. The real problem then, when it comes to free speech or indeed to any other issue, is not simply Islam as such, or even simply the conservative strands of Islam, though such strands are clearly deeply objectionable and need to be robustly challenged. It is also the liberal attitude, particularly in the West, as to what constitutes an authentic Muslim. The failure to see beyond the conservative or the reactionary as a true Muslim. The belief that to be anti-racist is to accept limits as to what can be said about different cultures of belief. Uh, uh, which is why I know many Muslims who have more liberal views on free speech than many so-called uh, liberal uh, non-believers. The problem, it seems to me, is also government policy, again, particularly in the West. Policymakers have all too often treated minority communities, and uh, uh, Muslim communities in particular, as if each was a distinct, homogenous whole, each composed of people all speaking with a single voice, each defined primarily by a single view of culture and faith. They've ignored the diversity within those communities, and again, taken the most conservative and reactionary voices to be the authentic ones. And worse, governments, both Western and non-Western, have often encouraged reactionary religious forces as a counterweight to radical opposition. There is, for instance, a, a terrible irony in, in, in Israel's current assault on Gaza, because it was Israel itself that helped Hamas gain power in the first place, viewing radical Islam as a, as a useful tool with which to counter the, the influence of the secular PLO after Israel had occupied Gaza after the Six-Day War. Um, it allowed the Muslim Brotherhood, which had previously banned, to set up there, encouraged it, funded it, and uh, funded a project that eventually became uh, Hamas. And but cynical as it is, there's nothing exceptional about that policy. And many governments, Western and non-Western, have pursued similar strategies. And such strategies have consistently strengthened the reactions against the progressives. Egypt, for instance, particularly under, under Sadat, um, looked to the Muslim Brotherhood to keep the radical left opposition in check. Similar processes from secular regimes in Iraq, in uh, Syria, um, even uh, 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 the governments in India have followed a similar kind of policy. Um, everyone knows it's a familiar story, you know, the American funding of uh, arming of, of groups, uh, jihadi groups in Afghanistan. Less well known is French domestic policy. You now we all think about France as you know, the government that has um, uh, denounces uh, what it calls Anglo-Saxon communism. Well. From time to time, in fact, quite often, it has encouraged French government policies to encourage uh, radical Islam um, under, the, under the government of uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, for instance, when there was a wave of car strikes, uh, strikes in car firms led largely by uh, North, North African workers. The, the government encouraged the building of prayer rooms in, in, in factories. Because in the words of uh, the, the government minister, Paul Dijoux at that time, the minister for immigration, he says, Islam is a stabilizing force which would turn the faithful from deviant delinquency or membership of unions or revolutionary politics. And that's been a, a, a common view, a common approach, a common strategy. So yes, there is something about Islam that needs challenging. But equally, there is something about secular liberalism and the blindness, cynicism, 
and pusillanimity of secular liberals, at least challenging too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, first of all, we should uh, welcome Majid Nawaz, who's made it here at last, mm -hmm. caught in traffic, but we're, we're leaving you till, till the end to catch your breath. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, next I'd like to invite our Miriam Namazi, but let me first um, tell you a little bit about Miriam's life and work. She's a political activist, a campaigner, uh, and a blogger. Um, she's a spokesperson for FITNA, a, a women's liberation movement. Um, uh, she is closely involved with the Council of Ex-Muslims in, in Britain, uh, as well as Iran Solidarity, which she founded, um, and the International Committee Against Stoning, and many other uh, organizations, too, too many to mention. She's an honorary uh, uh, um, associate of the National Secular Society, was indeed voted Secularist of the Year by them back in 2005. She's won numerous uh, awards from around the world for over a period of nearly three decades, for her humanitarian work and her journalism. Uh, she's worked recently, uh, in recent years tirelessly uh, in support of Iranian refugees. Uh, she was also, uh, for a time, the British Human Association's head of ceremonies. Uh, politically, she is uh, a member of the Central Committee of the Workers' Communist Party of Iran. Murray, welcome. And I believe you have slides as well. You'll have your, your clicker with you. Right. can't turn lights down, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me? Good. In this day and age, there is most certainly something about Islam. Not because it's any worse than other religions. As I've said many times before, all religions are equal and equally bad. No religion looks favorably upon women, gays, free thinkers, apostates, heretics, blasphemers, people of other religions and atheists. And punishing free thinkers has always been a fundamental and long-standing feature of all major religions. But there is something about Islam, primarily because it's the banner of, a, of Islamism, a far-right political movement spearheading what I call an Islamic inquisition. Islamists want the far-right restructuring of societies. Concretely, this means a khalifa or Islamic state, the implementation of Sharia law, the imposition of the borga, compulsory veiling, gender segregation, defending hudud punishments like death by stoning, and the execution of apostates, just to name a few. You don't have to look far to see what Islamism is. It's the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Saudi government, Boko Haram, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hezbollah Tahrir, the Taliban, and of course the Islamic State, formerly known as ISIS, which has made tremendous advances in the past few days and months, and which continues to shock and outrage all humanity with its sheer terror and brutality. ISIS is Islamism without its palatable wrappings, often fed to people in Europe and the West, where its manifestations, like Sharia courts in Britain, and the law society's guidance on Sharia wills, which institutionalizes Islamist values, are portrayed as people's right to religion, even by some humanist groups. Whilst there are differences in degree amongst Islamists, as there are in any phenomenon, Fundamentally, they are all striving for the same things, including groups like the Islamic Education and Research Academy in the UK, which has charitable status and which debates well-known scientists and atheists while defending the Khalifa and death to apostates. They're very kind, though, they say. They prefer beheading as it's less painful, possibly pain, uh, painless for them. It's, it's painless, they say. And also, they've been key in segregating British universities. Some keep telling us of such moderate or soft Islamists. In my opinion, there are none. Fascism is fascism, no matter how it is wrapped and dressed. There is also, in this context, 
no moderate Islam. Even if there are a million interpretations, today Islam is what ISIS tells you it is. It is what Khamenei in Iran tells you it is. It is what the Taliban says it is, by sheer terror and brute force. In many places, you must either submit to their Islam or die. When religion is in the state or has influence, it's no longer a question of personal belief, but of political power. Of course, when I talk about Islam, I'm not speaking of Islam as a personal belief, or Muslims who are believers, like my father and mother, and maybe some of yours. People practice Islam and religion, as Keenan mentioned, in innumerable personal ways. They pick and choose the aspects that fit their lives, and more often than not, people's humanity shines through irrespective of their religions or beliefs. Being Muslim doesn't mean one is an Islamist any more than being Turkish means you support Erdogan, or being Nigerian means you support Boko Haram, or being British means you support the British National Party or the Christian right. <coughs> No group or community or society is homogeneous. As Keenan Malik says, secularism and fundamentalism are not ideas stitched into people's DNA. They are like all values, observed, absorbed, accepted, or rejected. In fact, Muslims, or those to perceived to be Muslims, are the first victims and at the forefront of battling Islamism. Karima Ben Mune highlights nearly 300 such people and groups in her book called Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here. She records the resistance and refusal of so many people. Also, over the past decades, many have voted against Islamism with their feet by fleeing Islamic states and movements in unprecedented numbers. Right now, as we speak, thousands of Yazidis considered devil worshippers by ISIS languish in the mountains of Sinjar, with children dying of thirst and nowhere to go surrounded by ISIS. <coughs> Islam today isn't a private matter, especially not during an inquisition. Islam is not just the opium of the masses, as Marx has said, it is their genocide heir. Of course, it's very good to be balanced and speak of all religions being equally problematic, even after an enlightenment has removed much of Christianity's power and influence, Christianity is nowhere a benign force. It creates misery wherever it can. But you cannot look at ISIS right here and now, and its beheadings, and its crucifixions, and sexual jihad, and speak of similar attitudes during Victorian times in England or Europe's dark ages. ISIS represents our dark ages in the 21st century. It's good to be balanced, particularly when you have a far right using the issue of Sharia law and Islamism to attack immigrants and Muslims and absurdly demanding a ban on the Quran as if the Bible was banned to stop the Spanish Inquisition a far right that feigns crocodile tears for those killed by Islamists, yet cheers the massacre of innocent civilians in Gaza by the Israeli state. It is important to be balanced, but one must also be fair. If we cannot see that there is something about Islam and Islamism, then we cannot respond as we must. And if we don't, who will? Defending free thought and expression is crucial in this fight. Defending blasphemy and apostasy cases are hugely important. Removing blasphemy laws from the legal system is key. Oh, sorry, I'm really bad at this. It's, oh, I think I have to press harder. The Council of Ex-Muslims deals with hundreds of such cases each year, but it is not enough to defend free expression and thought within a limited human rights or legal context. We must see blasphemy and apostasy laws and a defense of free expression within the larger context of religion in general and Islam in particular 
vis-a-vis -vis the question of political power. God is sabotaging me. <laughs> Islam in the state or with political power is the end of free thought and the end of free expression. It is the end of democratic politics. It is the end of women's rights and gay rights and the rights of minorities. It is the end of everything that is worthy of the 21st century. It is a return to the dark ages. A humanist Congress today can only begin and end united for Sinjar and united against ISIS. It must stand unequivocally against Islamism, Sharia law and the Khalifa. This is not about people's right to religion. It is about stopping Islamism's right to kill and slaughter and oppress. A humanist Congress must stand for equality of people, not religions and beliefs. For universal rights, and this is a photo of Amina from Egypt, Alia El Mahdi from Egypt, sorry, Amina from Tunisia and myself, where I cut the Allah out of the Islamic regime's flag and we had a protest in support of women's rights and universal rights. A humanist Congress must stand for secularism and the separation of religion from the state, not just for Europe, but for the world. This is not a clash of civilizations. It is a clash between the theocrats and fascists versus the rest of us, Muslim and non, atheist and non. As the late Marxist Mansur Hikmat said, in Islam, the individual has no rights or dignity. In Islam, the woman is a slave. In Islam, the child is on par with animals. Free thinking is still deserving of punishment. It's a sin deserving of punishment. Music is corrupt. Sex without permission or religious certification is the greatest of sins. This is the religion of death. In reality, all religions are such, but most religions have been restrained by free thinking and freedom-loving humanity over hundreds of years. This one was never restrained or controlled. Restraining it, controlling it, in this day and age, that is our task. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Well, our third panelist is Alam Shah. Alam was born in Bangladesh, but grew up in a strict Bangladeshi community in southeast London in the 1970s and 80s, where he was forced to go to a mosque frequently and learn and recite the Quran, the Quranic surahs in Arabic, without any understanding of the meaning of those words. He's written that his mother's tragic death when he was just 13 had one positive consequence. It relieved me of any sense of duty or shame that may have made me try harder to follow the religion I was born into. Alan recently headed up the uh, Rationalist Association's Apostasy Project, supporting non-believers from religious traditions within the UK. Teacher, science writer, and filmmaker, he spent most of his professional life sharing his passion for science and education with his pupils and the wider public. He teaches at a comprehensive school in, in London, writes for a number of print and online publications, and, as I'm sure many of you know, is the author of The Young Atheist's Handbook, which has won widespread praise in humanist circles for being a moving, honest, and nuanced tale of losing religion and continuing to lead a meaningful life. The BHA organized a successful fundraising campaign that enabled it to send the book to all English and Welsh secondary schools. So, to encourage children who wanted to exercise their freedom of belief, particularly when they come from strong religious backgrounds. Ellen, over to you. Um, you probably can't see me much better. Than that. <laughs> um, uh, I'm very nervous about speaking this afternoon. I'm going to start by thanking uh, lots of people in this room who have supported my work. I'm incredibly grateful for the fact that you put my book into, into school so that it can reach the audience that I want it to reach, young people. Um, I haven't got a script, and I, I haven't prepared. I'm going to confess that up front, because I wanted to hear what Ken and Marion were saying. I asked Jim, I'm sorry to say, to, to let me go later in the lineup. And I'm nervous, not because I haven't prepared, because I'm a teacher, I never plan my lessons anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm nervous because um, what I'm going to say may upset one or two of you. Um, I wrote a book called The Young Atheist Handbook, and I, I wanted it. I dreamed that it would fall into the hands of young people, and it hasn't really, because young people don't buy books. So most of the people who've read my book, who buy my book, are adults. And uh, lots of you say lots of nice things about it. And as a consequence of writing that book, I've been invited to give lots of talks to lots of atheists and humanists and so-called skeptics and rationalists. So I've been preaching to the choir. And what's funny is that I, I, I haven't become a champion for atheism or humanism. I've become a champion for Islam. Does that surprise you? What's happened is that I turn up at these talks and inevitably there's someone in the crowd who thinks that I am going to confirm their prejudices about Islam who asks the question, inevitably, which, where they want me to say something mean about Islam, to confirm that Islam is the worst religion in the world, that it's this horrible, awful thing, and that all Muslims are awful, and isn't it great that I, I managed to grow up and leave it all behind? They want to hear that story from me, but that's not my story. I've written my story, go and buy it, it's in the bookshop. Right? <laughs> but I, I, I've, I've been shocked, really, because I've turned up at these meetings, and. You know, even at this conference, somebody came up to me and said something along the lines of, um, well, shouldn't humanists raise money and then, then maybe we could create a vaccine against Islam? <laughs> somebody said that to me, expecting me to agree. And I, I kind of had to walk away. Because I think the problem with Islam, one of the problems with Islam is that there's this tremendous phobia against it. It is a phobia. There is an Islamophobia. There's tremendous prejudice against Muslims. And the reason why I respond so strongly against it is because for my, most of my childhood, I, I experienced that kind of prejudice and hatred directed towards me personally because I was brown. I grew up in an environment where racism was acceptable, where we were spat at in the street. Do you know what that feels like? We were spat at in the street. We were called packy in the street. We were told to fuck off back home in the street. And this was entirely acceptable. And for a golden period in my life, I think the 90s, before 9-11, before racism got better. There were campaigns, you know, people worked to fight racism. And it, and it went away. And I, I went through a period in my life where I thought, you know, racism was better. It had gone away. And now I encounter something similar to racism from people who, who I should get along with, but in, against Muslims. And we have people saying, well, Muslim Islam isn't a race, it's not racism. Go and read the internet and find out why that's a pathetic argument. I'm not going to rehearse it here. Um, I'm not qualified to talk about Islam, really. You know, I, I'm not an academic, I'm not a priest of any sort. I lived a very particular form of Islam. It was the Islam of Bangladeshi Sileti people in the Elephant and Castle. And that's a really important point because the Islam that is lived by people in this country is diverse. The, the, the different communities that practice it, the different families that practice it, the different <coughs> individuals that practice it, practice it on their own terms. And yet, people, so many people continue to think that there is this monolithic thing called Islam where they all hold the same beliefs, they all want to take over the West and destroy <coughs> it and oppress women and all that. You know, those are real issues. I'm not denying that. Those are real issues. But what's happened is that I think Muslims are, are made to feel like second-class citizens. They're made to feel like they are not liked or wanted. And I've experienced this myself because I'm brown. People assume I'm a Muslim if they haven't met me or read my book or whatever. I'm, just, I'm going to talk about my personal experience. I was on a train <coughs> shortly after the 7-7 um, attacks. I was on a train and uh, there was a guy sitting opposite me and he was drinking a can of lager. And uh, he leaned across from his seat and he said, why do you hate us? <laughs> he said, why do you hate us? And I knew what he was talking about. I immediately knew what he was talking about. And it, it kind of broke my heart that he would think he was hated by an entire group of people. And I just said, I said, we don't. I said, we, even though I don't identify as a Muslim. I said, we really don't. And, and thankfully, he leaned back and he seemed to accept my answer. And 
the other place where I encountered this, I, I wrote a book, and it's been published, it's amazing. By the way, it's really amazing to have a book published, it's just like, I never dreamt it would happen. I started to dream it would happen once I got an agent. And she said, she said you're, you're going to write a brilliant book, but we'll get it published. I, I started to believe that it would happen. And she was fantastic, this woman. She, she got me meetings with all the major publishers, so really well connected. Um, and um, I was sat in meetings where people uh, at these big publishing companies, these famous publishing companies, were discussing the cover designs for my book. You know, and uh, I sat in a meeting with like nine marketing people once, and basically they were really excited because I could walk and talk at the same time, and I wasn't terribly bad looking, you know. And, and they were talking about radio interviews they could set up, they were talking about television I could do. And I was sitting there thinking, wow, I'm going to have this amazing book deal, you know, my career's made. Um, and then the rejection started coming in. Um, it was really weird, I was like, wait, hold on, you were discussing book covers last week. And, 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 and uh, you know, I, I didn't really understand it. I, didn't, I thought maybe it's just the publishing in the industry is just like television, full of bullshitters. You know, that's, uh, that's, um, and then we got an email from one of the editors, and from an editor who had published uh, a really famous atheist text. You can probably guess which one. And she said, she said, I really want to publish this book. Um, but I can't convince my colleagues to agree because they're too scared. She said, my colleagues were too scared to publish my book. Why were they scared? Because they thought that a book about atheism, and if you've read my book, it's not anti-Islamic or inflammatory in any way, uh, they, they thought they couldn't publish a book about atheism by someone from a Muslim background because they feared attacks and so forth. Um, and that fear was clearly real. But what that fear was founded on was the Islamophobia that is spread by the likes of the Daily Mail and the Sun and so forth. We, we've man and and well, it doesn't matter that my book wasn't published by these people. What matters is that they were self-censoring. They, they were self-censoring uh, because of the image of Muslims and so forth that we have. And once, even once I got a deal from an Australian company, um, people kept coming up to me and saying, aren't you scared? Aren't you scared about what's going to happen to you? And my God, how insulting to the people we saw this morning to ask me, who lives in the West with all the protections and the freedoms of the West, to ask me if I'm scared. Um, and I still get it at this conference today. Someone said, um, you know, you're like those guys. If you'd written your book elsewhere, you'd be dead now. Um, because obviously if you're a Muslim or from a Muslim background and you say anything about atheism or humanism, that's what's going to happen to you. And these are the attitudes that are held by, as Kenan said, by lots of people who should know better. And it's, it's frustrating, and what I'm, I'm sharing this at this conference, because I, unfortunately I suspect there are people in this room who hold prejudiced views about Muslims. Let's put Islam to one side. Islam is this idea which people interpret differently, but when you make generalised generalized statements about Islam, what you're doing is you're attacking people, you're attacking Muslims. And you have to be very careful about how you talk about these things because I wrote a book where I say, you know, the Quran's full of nonsense. You know, I, I say that. And nobody's killed me, nobody's attacked me. It's okay to say that. It's when we start talking about Muslims who want to do this or want to do that that I think it becomes problematic. I think part of the problem is, really, Unlike me, who has lots of white, middle-class, Christian, non-Christian friends, I think a lot of people that I meet don't actually know any Muslims. You know, and, and, and I don't know how we solve that. I, I don't think we can make gatherings or whatever. But I, I find it unfortunate that people who pride themselves on critical thinking and being rationalist and so forth are not critical when it comes to adopting the views that are propagated by the likes of the Daily Mail. And I, 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 I was, I've been at, I keep giving you examples. It was a humanist meeting where a woman said to me, Muslims are destroying our way of life. And I just said, can you give me an example? Can you give me an example on how Muslims in the UK have in any way infringed on your life? You know, and, and she couldn't. Recently, um, all Muslims think homosexuals should be executed, even the liberal ones. I said, really? Um, none of my Muslim friends think homosexuals should be 
executed. Where, where are you getting this information? And, you know, they must be getting their information from the main, mainstream media. That's what I think. Um, and I'm sharing this with you because I don't want you to, to leave this session walking away thinking, yeah, there is something about Islam. It's awful. But yes, there are. I'm sure the other panellists will, will raise matters about Islam as a religion, as a theology that, that, that is problematic. I'm not going to talk about that, but I, I really want you to be careful about separating any notions you have about Islam from the lived experiences of Muslims, for me, in this country. I don't know what it's like in the countries where you come from, but the Muslims that often are spoken about when I go to these meetings, when people want to attack Muslims, those Muslims are my friends and my family. And th th these are the people who, who didn't uh, set me on fire or anything when my book was published. These are people who went and bought my book. One of my Bangladeshi friends bought 50 copies and gave it out to everyone he knew. I went to a, a picnic the other day with... I feel, I feel slightly embarrassed, I have to confess. So whenever I meet with the old friends and family, I just feel slightly awkward and embarrassed. I've written this book and, you know, I've rejected your culture and all that. And they kind of, they've always known I was a bit of a weirdo, <laughs> you know. I, I used to dress funny when I was a kid, I had an earring and all that, they knew I was a bit of a rebel and, and this book that I've written is just part of that to them. And what you don't hear about is the rich tradition in these communities of thinking about things for themselves and so forth. The people I know have bought and read my book and none of them have said they're wrong and in fact I'm going to stop waffling because clearly I don't have any thesis here. Look, <laughs> you know, you know what what my friends and family said when, when they read my book. They didn't care that I had rejected Islam. They didn't care. What, what they said was it was wonderful to read their story in a book because my story is their story. They, they went through the same stuff that I went through. Part of my journey has been to reject Islam. But they're still proud of me that I'm a Bangladeshi, came to this country and I've written a book. They're still proud of that. They're, they're still glad that I got to tell my story. And I nearly didn't get the chance to tell my story because of the prejudiced views that people hold about Muslims in this country. I'm really glad I eventually got published, but I nearly didn't get published because of the negative views people hold about Muslims in, in general. I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you very much, Alan. Well, last but not, not least is Majid Nawaz, who is the co-founder and chairman of anti-extremism think tank uh, Quilliam and co-founder of Hordi, uh, a social movement campaigning uh, to entrench democratic culture in young people in Pakistan. Himself, a British Pakistani, he studied Arabic and law at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies in London, took a master's degree in political theory at the London School of Economics. As a young student in London, he was recruited to Hizb Tahrir and became a speaker and recruiter for the party, traveling to Pakistan and setting up cells from London. He was arrested in 2001 in Egypt and remained in prison until 2006. He resigned from Hizb Tahrir in May 2007 and has since become a prominent counter-extremist consultant and a regular writer, debater and public commentator. Nawaz is a Liberal Democrat prospective parliamentary candidate for Hampstead and Kilburn. Speaking on the BBC's Big Questions television uh, programme, he argued that um, a Jesus and Mo cartoon deemed offensive by many Muslim commentators did not offend him personally, later tweeting the words, this is not offensive and I'm sure God is greater than to feel threatened by it, alongside a, a reproduction of the image. Nawaz has received a slew of death threats for his stance on this issue. Rajat, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I apologise for being slightly late. London is pretty much closed down because of the uh, cycling uh, event and also a pro-Palestine demonstration happening at the same time. So I had to get through lots and lots of traffic and angry people. Um, I want to speak today briefly, and then hopefully there'll be a lot of uh, time for discussion. I want to, to speak briefly um, on behalf of, though I don't 
claim to represent anyone. Uh, I claim always only to represent my own views. I don't represent Muslims or non-Muslims. I don't represent humanists or liberals. I'm a non-representative. I'm not elected to any office. In fact, I could probably claim to represent the Camden Liberal Democrats when they selected me to be their parliamentary candidate. But today I want to speak on my own behalf for the values and the beliefs that I believe in and hold dear. And if they resonate with you, I'd like all of you to carry this message forward. I want to speak on behalf of the thousands upon thousands of Shiite Muslims who have been slaughtered in an ongoing attempted genocide in Pakistan. I want to speak on behalf of the thousands of Ahmadis who are persecuted in Pakistan, my country of origin. I want to speak on behalf of the thousands upon thousands of Christians in Iraq who've had their uh, homes taken from them, had their women raped, they've had their homes marked with the Arabic letter Noon, which stands for Nazarene, uh, the Arabic word for Christians, one of the Arabic words for Christians. I want to speak on behalf of the Yazidis who've been forced up a mountain, fleeing for their very lives. And on behalf of the Shiites in Iraq who've also been uh, butchered, um, all of these minorities who children, whose children have been chopped in half by this demonic, uh, plague-like organization that calls itself ISIS. I want to speak on behalf of all the women and my minorities in Nigeria, such as the Christians there, who in the name of my culture, in my faith, in the name of my religion, have been enslaved and sold into sexual slavery. As I said, I don't represent any of these groups, but I wish to speak on behalf of them because they are voiceless here today. And we must remember what's going on. Now, what is going on is certainly not uh, a minority of terrorists, though it is that as well, who are terrorizing people who disagree with them, even the Sufis in Iraq, who are from a Sunni Muslim background, whose mosques and shrines you've seen being blown up on television. Yes, they are a minority of terrorists who have seized power, but that's not all that is going on. To analyze this situation as one being a minority of terrorists would be to misdiagnose the problem. And that's what President Obama has been doing up until yesterday. Thankfully, they've intervened to save the Yazidis in Iraq. But the misdiagnosis was as follows. Because we know that under President Obama, America has increased drone strikes at a rate far higher than George Bush ever did. And that's because of the premise. The premise was we're dealing with a mafia-like organization called Al-Qaeda. And if we take out the head, if we assassinate the leader, then we will deal with the organization. And like a Medusa's head, in fact, what did happen is this organization mutated and mutated and generated locally enfranchised uh, organizations and groups with, with, with deep roots in the societies that they were operating in. We are not dealing with just a global terrorist organization. In fact, it's not even one organization anymore. We are dealing with a global jihadist insurgency. We must recognize that. This is a global jihadist insurgency. It has taken root in countries from Pakistan and Afghanistan, all the way through North Africa, into the Middle East, and it has strong support, just as communism did. Now, to speak briefly about definitions, when I talk about Islamism, when I talk about Islamism, in the values that I believe, you can dis disagree with these definitions if you like. But when I talk about Islamism, what I mean is the desire, in one sentence for you, the desire to impose any given interpretation of Islam over society. For me, that's what I oppose. When I talk about jihadism, I talk about the use of force to spread Islamism. I oppose Islamism at its core, not just when it's violent. Anybody who wishes to impose any interpretation of my family's faith and my family's culture on any society, not just in a non-Muslim majority society, on any society, is a fascist. And that ideology, call it what you like, must be opposed by all of us, not just by Muslims. Yes, it's nice when a Muslim speaks out about these things, but it must be opposed by all of us, just like Nazism needed to be opposed, not just by Germans. All of us have a role to play in defeating this global jihadist insurgency. Now, if we recognize this as a global jihadist insurgency with an ideology at its core, then we will not misdiagnose the problem and think just by military strikes we can solve this. 
Communism didn't become unattractive to young, angry teenagers today just because of military strikes. Sorry, I should clarify for Miriam's sake, my apologies. I mean Stalin Soviet communism. The USSR version didn't become unattractive and unappealing just, by, just because of uh, military strikes. There's, a, there's, an ancient, there's an old question about whether we deal with this through law or war. Well, in fact, what we must recognize is that law has its place, war has its place. I support the strikes against ISIS that are ongoing today in Iraq. I think the Kurdish Peshmerga and the Iraqi forces should complement that with a ground offensive. Law has its place, war has its place. War did not have its place with the original invasion of Iraq, in my opinion. But in this instance, it does. But beyond law and war, there's an ideological struggle which we must be engaged in. And that's to recognize the true nature of this problem. Because Islamism as an ideology has become the zeitgeist for politically engaged, active, angry, I say angry here just so we're not generalizing all Muslims, the politi politically engaged, active and angry young Muslims across the world, and especially in the West. Those who oppose foreign policy, those who oppose the status quo, they're currently, and it can change and it will change, but currently the zeitgeist is the Islamist ideology. So we're dealing with a civil rights crisis, a huge civil rights crisis. If you have up to 500 British born and raised Muslims who have gone to Syria and Iraq to join ISIS, this tells us we have a huge problem because you don't just get 500 coming out of a vacuum. Let's remember what we're talking about here. This is a group that was too extreme for Al-Qaeda, a group that Al-Qaeda expelled, a group that is chopping children in half right now in Iraq. British born and raised Muslims, up to 500 of them, have gone to join this particular organization, and they're choosing it over Al-Qaeda even. That doesn't happen in a vacuum. That doesn't just come from nowhere like that. That means there's a serious problem with the spread of this ideology on the grassroots in this country, and up to 3,000 went over from across Europe, all of whom have European citizenship, all of whom can enter this country without a visa. Hundreds have gone from Australia. Tens have gone from North America. The foreign fighters that make up ISIS were some of their most brutal fighters. Chechens, North Africans, many Europeans, 700 from France. For these numbers to go and join an organization that brutal, it means there must be a level of residual empathy for this ideology. As demonstrated by the black flags of ISIS being flown in the Gaza rallies, and I oppose Israel's disproportionate actions in Gaza, but there is no place for those flags. That's like flying a swastika flag. And as demonstrated by the fact that in Tower Hamlets just a couple of days ago, somebody raised the black flag of ISIS. What do, we, what do we do about this situation? Well, if we're dealing with a global jihadist insurgency, if we're dealing with an ideology that has taken root in the hearts and minds of certain sectors who are angry within the Muslim communities, then we must be engaged in not just a battle of law and war, but we must also be engaged in an ideological fight back. And with which ideas and values do we stand firm and strong to and propagate and push in the face of this ideological onslaught? They can only be secular liberal democracy. They can only be the values that we have taken for granted that are being eaten away at, as demonstrated by some of the examples the earlier speakers mentioned. The entryist approach, where some of the very institutions in this country are being affected by a call to begin creeping in this ideology, for example, in some of the schools, in some of the state schools, in some of the councils, and in some of the institutions of our country, such as the law society, such as the banks. So we must understand what we believe in, understand what we're dealing with. And I can only conclude by saying deal with it in a way that is responsible, as the previous speaker mentioned, that doesn't stigmatize all those who have everything to lose if this ideology comes to power, other Muslims. Because I'll end on this point that the ones who have lost their lives, the biggest casualties in this war, this global jihadist insurgency, are first and foremost other Muslims. Whether they're Sufis, whether they're Shia, other Muslim minorities, those who disagree with them, people who don't believe 
even if they're Sunni majority mainstream Muslims, but they simply don't believe in Islamism as I've defined it. They are the first victims. They are hunted down first and foremost because they're seen as traitors from within. I've seen this ideology close up. I lived in prison with the assassins of Sadat. I lived in prison with the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. I've seen the full spectrum from political entries to Islamism all the way through to takfirism. I've seen people wake up in the morning believing they're Muslim, going to bed thinking they may have apostatized and waking up having a ritual bath the next morning. Because that's how quickly they think people can pass in and out of the faith because of their judgmental attitude. This ideology, and it's why I left it, it's why I have decided to dedicate my life struggle to criticizing it. This ideology is poisonous. And if you think Animal Farm and George Orwell's book, and what he wrote about the dangers of totalitarianism mean anything, then today they apply to the Islamist ideology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There we have it. If anyone thought that this session was going to be some sort of self-indulgent, superficial excuse for a bit of Islam bashing, I think you've heard articulated a range of very impassioned views on just how subtle and complex some of these issues are. We have half an hour. Uh, the floor is now open for, for questions. Um, if you, those of you in the back half, you, you forgive us. We won't stand up. Uh, for every time I want to give an answer, just to keep the, the, it flowing. Uh, microphones, I guess, on, on either side, yes? So we can start with two hands raised here. So yes, yes, and then, and then I'll move over to the other side. The gentleman there, yeah. Very simple, short. Question, who is centrally organizing the Islamic jihadist movement throughout the world? How and where is it centered? How is it being uh, centrally organized, which is the implication uh, strongly of your tool, which I thought um, was superbly uh, centered on the problems, current problems, and brought it home much more starkly than many of us realize. But uh, what are your views on how it is being uh, promoted throughout the world? I guess that's for you. So uh, there, is, there is no longer a central, in fact there never was a central coordinating body. It started with the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928. They were the mothership. Off, uh, an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood was my former organization, Hizb al-Tahrir. And they went from being entryists to being revolutionary Islamists, seeking military coups in Muslim majority societies. And an, off, an offshoot from the revolutionary Hizb al-Tahrir movement were the jihadists, such as the Islamic Jihad in Egypt, which mutated into Al-Qaeda, which has now mutated into ISIS. But all of the other groups prior to those still exist as well. So as well as um, they, 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 the, the, what's happening here is that so there's no central command structure. There are all of them are reinforcing the same principles, but they're competing with with each other to do so. So the, the victor out of all of this is the Islamist ideology. Even where they're hating on each other, they're hating on each other, claiming that they're more Islamist than the other one. So they're reinforcing the Islamist ideology as a result of that sort of competition. And we're no strangers to that, because we know that at the end of the day, it was uh, Stalin that killed Trotsky. You know. So let's go to the back, and then we'll come to the front. Yeah. Thank you very much. I've got a question, I think, from Majid, and I think he was advocating uh, action, military action on the ground against ISIS. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you think I don't think there should be Western troops on the ground in Iraq. I think that they should complement the Peshmerga, the Kurdish forces, and the Iraqi army by supporting them with airstrikes. I don't think Western troops and boots should be on the ground. And in that sense, uh, the exit strategy is less of a, of a, of a sticking point because um, the airstrikes, of course, the planes can just fly away. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? The point about ISIS. You don't have to. No, fine, good. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, this is the second time in the last couple of weeks that I've, I've heard an, an Asian Muslim um, describe as learning the Quran in Arabic by rote without having any understanding of it. 
Um, does anybody think that this might be some of the reason why Asian Muslims are more easily radicalized? Because they'll be getting their interpretation from uh, whoever teaches them the Quran rather than being able to do their own exegesis. I think the, the, the Arabs of Syria and Iraq certainly understand it. Oh, sure. But I'm just about British Asian Muslims. British, okay. Uh, it's, it's not a practice that's unique to Islam. Uh, historically, the uh, Bible would have been written in Latin in language. It's uh, still in, in high Catholic church, I believe it's read out in Latin and so forth. Um, I think any young person who takes an interest in Islam would be likely to seek a translation. So I, I don't think it's a, it's a major reason for why young British Asians would turn to extremism, no. I also think that there's a, you know, there's a complex social, political um, set of development that allowed radicalization in Britain. And, and I don't think we should, we should kind of um, narrow it down a little bit or see it in simple, in simple terms. I mean, if you go back, um, you can think about Islam in Britain, um, Muslim immigration in Britain, post-war Muslim immigration in Britain, in, in terms of three generations. There's the first generation, my parents' generation, if you like, um, who came here in the 50s and 60s, um, who were religious, but in a very different way from what deeply religious means today. Um, they barely attended mosque, and, and, and nobody, nobody worried about it. They, they, they attended mosque with a pride in feeling to them. M the men drank, they went to pubs, and again, and they didn't make a song and dance about it, but they weren't ostracized for it. Um, no, no woman wore a headscarf or, or a veil. Not because they didn't think themselves Muslim, they thought themselves deeply Muslim, but they didn't think of themselves as a Muslim community. There was no such thing as a Muslim community until the late 80s in Britain. I grew up in a, the second generation. I wasn't born here, but um, I, I'm effectively the second generation. We were broadly secular. It's interesting, when you talk about radical in the context of Islam today, what most people mean are fundamentalists. When I was growing up, radical in the, in the context of the kind of communities I come from meant the very opposite. Radical meant being secular, westernized, someone like me. Um, uh, and in a sense, the, 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 the change you can see is a change in that definition of that one word expresses the change we can see. And it's only the third generation, if you like, the, 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 the post-1980s and um, 1990s generation um, that have become radicalized. And so, I mean, I remember when I was a student in the 1980s, God, it's a long time ago, but I remember his book, they, they, they literally worked three men and a dog, um, um, and with, uh, with no dog. Um, I mean, they, they were uh, tiny. And, you know, I, used to have, I used to have absurd arguments with them. Um, but it was in the late 80s, in the 90s, for a whole host of different reasons. Um, one was, of course, Bosnia, international reasons. Bosnia, uh, in particular, uh, uh, played a major role. Second was the rise of Identity politics, we never called it identity politics in those days, but identity politics, the much more narrow, parochial sense of, 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 of seeing oneself. The rise of multicultural was a policy by which, which partly what I talked about, by which public policy was to see people belonging to specific groups, um, put people into boxes and see, li, 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 you're a Muslim, you're a Hindu, you're a Sikh, and so on. And I never thought of myself in those terms. None of my friends did. Um, and it's interesting that in the late 70s, early 80s, the main struggles in our communities were all political, um, uh, against immigration controls, against uh, police brutality, uh, against discrimination in workplace. By the end of the 1980s, it was almost all cultural. Um, uh, uh, separate schools for, for girls, halal meat at schools, and most explosively, the satanic verses. In a space of less than a decade, it changed. And it changed because the nature of politics changed, the nature of relationship between um, uh, Muslims, young Muslims and, and society changed. But most importantly, the interesting thing is that people talk about um, a sense of alienation as radicalizing was well what we're talking about here are actually people who are far more integrated than even perhaps I was when I was growing up certainly more integrated than, than, than my parents were um, so this is a complex story um, uh, uh, and we need to understand it in its complexity we need to challenge it fight it 
Uh, but we can only do so if we understand um, the historical changes, the historical shifts, and, and the complexity of this. Yeah, I mean, I, a couple of points. I think one is uh, with, with the rise of uh, identity politics. We, we saw that after the end of the Cold War, where we did see an end of concepts such as universal rights. I mean, the, the West had always portrayed itself as a bastion of universal rights, a refuge for refugees and asylum seekers. And at the end of the Cold War, we did see an end of this sort of universalism. And uh, then, you know, everything became identity politics, you know. People are no longer human. It's based on their identity, uh, you know, what they're considered to be and what their positions are. Whereas we know very well that it's not um, who we are, that it's not, you know, our ethnicity or our um, religion or belief necessarily that define who we are, but the choices we make and the political uh, decisions that we take. Um, and also, I think it's important to recognize the role of the Islamic regime of Iran in this equation. I mean, when you talk about the Rushdie affair, when you talk about even Sharia courts in Britain, this is all after the expropriation of the revolution by an Islamic movement and the exportation of that movement internationally. Uh, so a lot of the sort of Islamism that we see has links with that exportation. I just want to add one thing. I think there's a lot of uh, mistaken conflation that's made, and you know, and I, I want to stress the point that I made in my talk is that Muslims as people have as many different beliefs as there are Muslims, and very often, even I am considered a Muslim just because I come from Iran and so on and so forth. The other is, of course, Islam. You know, if someone says that if you're highly critical of Islam, it's seen as an attack on Muslims. I think that's not a very good correlation to make because that's a belief, and beliefs should be open to criticism. And particularly, Islam needs to be open to criticism. And those of us who fled Islam, who faced threats and intimidations by the Islamist movement, who've lost many of our friends and families and loved ones, we have a need to be able to criticize Islam without being told that we're being Islamophobic and racist for doing so. I have a big problem with the term Islamophobia. I think it's a political term used to scare Monga people into silence. I will criticize Islam. I will criticize it to its core, as I will criticize any belief that I find inhuman. That's separate from attacking people who are believers. And the, the third thing is Islamism. I think this, um, you know, this uh, insistence on defending, you know, the, uh, you know, being, uh, asking people to be very careful on their criticisms of Islam, equating it with an attack on Muslims. What happened to Islamism? I mean, that's, uh, you know, in my opinion, a fascist movement and one that needs to be addressed, one that needs to be. Um, opposed full force and wholeheartedly. And given the fact that Islam is its banner, it is important to also be able to criticize uh, its banner without being accused of racism and Islamophobia. Okay, so we have one over there, and then one over there, and, and I'm trying to memorize the others, so there and there. Right. One, one of the problems um, from my, frankly, privileged background I can see with the Muslim community is the way it's represented in the media, and part of the problem is obviously the casual racism of the British media, but also the selection of community leaders and representatives of the Muslim and Asian community, um, and that's again by some other media, but also done by the British government, where they arbitrarily put the, you know, the head of a mosque or to represent all Muslims. And I was wondering, can the panel think of any other way in which this can be improved? Is there a better system or is there a better group of leaders and representatives that can be put forward to better represent what is in part your community? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, first of all, we have to accept the fact that there is no Muslim community in the same way that there is no Christian community or even British community. I mean, there are fascists in the English Defence League and the BNP and UKIP. Um, you know, that put, makes your hair stand on end, and others who defend, uh, you know, very different and human values. And I think one is to, to realize that there's no community. Second of all, I mean, I think what, what the sorts of creating of communities has been very useful for, for very many states, because what it's done is it's handed over entire groups of people on the cheap to self-appointed imams and parasitical Islamic organizations 
uh, very often with links to the Islamist movement, handed them over. I think the, the solution is very simple. Citizenships, these are citizens of this country. There, there, there is a relationship between a citizen versus the state. Why do you need you know, uh, parasites and reactionary to, to speak on behalf of countless uh, individuals in this country who have various views, who are dissenters, free thinkers. When you do that, you actually shrink the space for people to be able to dissent because they're told the Brit Muslim Council of Britain represents them. You know, and some children represent them. They don't. They are not the representative. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Mariam and I agree 100% on this, which is a good thing, because we cooperated on a Newsnight film on that very subject, which, um, which uh, ended in a bit of a farce, because they brought in two of our so-called community leaders into the studio afterwards, and uh, I was there because I commissioned the film, I made this film, and Mariam kindly agreed to participate as one of the interviewees. We interviewed, um, Mariam as an ex-Muslim, we interviewed a gay Muslim who still says he's a Muslim, we interviewed a mosque leader, we interviewed a Muslim actor, um, we interviewed a Muslim feminist to demonstrate that there isn't just one way of being Muslim and that any self-appointed community leader cannot possibly represent this sheer diversity. And again, Muslim made a very, very pertinent point. He said that on a conservative estimate, 9 to 11 percent of any given community is gay, which means that if there are 3 million Muslims in the UK, 9 to 11 percent, somebody can do the maths. It's not my expertise. But there was hundreds of thousands of potentially gay Muslims actually are gay Muslims in the UK. And that's just one example. So the film was to demonstrate all of that. It's on YouTube, and you can see the farce it descended into afterwards. Thankfully, one of the so-called community leaders that was in the studio and was shouting me down alongside the other one, uh, one of them has since been very, very much so discredited and has never been on television again. So. Yeah. I'm not saying I did it. I wasn't responsible for that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so we had. Yes, there, and, uh, and there's a lady there. Uh, my, my question is of uh, Northern Ireland in mind and the historical Catholic Street Protestant problems there. You know, certain people from Northern Ireland are working in the, uh, in the Muslim world trying to sort, sort things out. Um, but from my point of view, um, this idea that one was, one speaker said he was defending the Shiites. I mean, I lived uh, in Northern East two years, which was 100% Sunni Muslim. And the loveliest people I've, I've ever met. So to say that the Sunnis are all bad, I think I, I would not, do, not agree with them. Uh, but certainly the, the question then is is there any chance at all of getting the two sides to talk together based on the Northern Ireland solution? I, I'll take Chairman's prerogative here and just and add a quick comment of my own. Uh, because I spent my the first until I was almost 17 uh, in Iraq, is in the 60s and 70s. This is pre Saddam. We, we left Iraq two weeks after Saddam came to power. Um, but I, I mean, my dad's a Shia Muslim, my, my mother's a, a, a devout Protestant Christian. Uh, it, what it meant for us at home was that we celebrated Eid and Christmas, and, and it was great. Um, but I never knew who was the Shia and who was a Sunni kid in my class. We knew the two Christian lads because they went out and kicked a football during RE lessons. They didn't have to sit in RE lessons. No one knew, no one cared, and it was, I mean, partly you could say because of the, the dictatorship of the Ba'ath Party putting a secular suppression on, on religious views, that maybe it was bubbling under, under the surface, but as a kid growing up, as a teenager, I wasn't aware of it. But you know, we, were, we didn't know, you know this, there was no goodies or baddies, Sunni or Shia. The, the kids who were more, who came from religious families were, this was okay, this was in Baghdad, um, it was more sort of uh, westernized attitudes, whatever that word means. But the kids who are more religious were, were referred to as mutadeans. You know, they, these were the sort of not the, 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 the weirdos, but they were the minority. You know, they were where it's completely opposite now. So I mean, I think it's um, that supports Keenan's point about what uh, the attitude of Muslims in Britain in the 70s and 80s. Something changed. Something changed in Iraq. I, I, I don't. I don't personally think we can blame it entirely on the US-British invasion 2003, that suddenly, you know, Saddam, well, he may have been a genocidal maniac, but he, at least he kept a secular lid on, on these tensions, you know, two, two evils, you know, don't make a good 
Anyway, I should... Uh, just, just, just a point of fact. Yes. I, I, I didn't hear anyone saying the swings are bad, just as a point of fact. No, that, that's, that's a very good point. You're, you're looking at particular examples of where it so happens that there are a group who are Sunni. Yeah. Who well, are. Yeah, I mean, I'm Sunni. My entire family is Sunni. I mean, it's not about all Sunni Muslims. It's about these particular uh, people that subscribe to the Islamist ideology. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, I think uh, part of the... the, the um, Problem, the issue is that there, in my opinion, it's, you know, yesterday in, in the Times there was huge headlines, religious war in Iraq, and I don't, I think the problem is Islamism. It's not that people can't live with each other, but when you have political movements that are actually creating this sort of enmity and uh, problems, you, you do find people then, uh, you know, these divisions are, are created in the sense there's some political gain for a lot of these groups where, where they're doing this. Because in many places before, um, let's say before ISIS, the Yazidis were living fine in Iraq. And they were living along the Sunnis, you know. Uh, so were, you know, so many others, uh, you know, as, as Khalid said, as, uh, so many of uh, my family are half Shia, half Sunni, Christians, and we celebrated all of them, which is great as well. So in a sense, I think it has, a lot to do with Islamism. I think we have to, it's important for us. I mean, for me, I think it, it's crucial, and I do feel slightly disappointed um, by the humanist movement, to be honest, if we're sharing our, 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 our souls. But, um, you know, because I, I find that a lot of times there isn't this focus on Islamism. We get a lot of questions about Muslims and, uh, you know, uh, can, can they ever live together like we can? And, and the fact of the matter is that, and what I try to stress in my talk is that it's the fascism we need to worry about, it's Islamism we need to worry about. And then people will be given the chance to live as, as they choose and as they want. You know, and here in the West we have, in a sense, this sort of thinking being fed in by what is considered the authentic Muslim, you know? And it, you can't be an authentic Muslim unless you want Sharia law, unless you like the Borha, unless you, you know, you want an Islamic state. <laughs> Look at the numbers. I mean, what are the largest numbers of refugees in the world? They're all from our regions. Yeah, it's all people who've left Sharia law and Islamism. You know, look at the numbers fleeing ISIS now. You know, so we, we have, in, in, in five years' time, if ISIS stays there, you'll have British humanists talking about people's right to religion. ISIS wants the Borgha. You know, the people there want the Borgha, so we all need to accept it. So I think we need to realize that, one, people are as different as we are sitting in this room, and two, that it's the movements that are creating a lot of the, the difficulties and that we need to target those as opposed to think that, oh, Shias and Sunnis can never live together. Well, what's interesting actually is when I said I'm an ex-Muslim, I was told by many people that, oh, it's not serious really because you weren't even a Muslim in the first place, you're a Shia. And that's the first time I actually realized there was a problem with being a Shia, you know what I mean? So. Uh, it's a lot of things that the Islamists do that are then translated as being people's desires and wishes, and it's not necessarily the case. Elam, you were frowning, and I'm not sure whether you were thinking deeply or, or ready to jump in. <laughs> I, I almost don't want to make any comments. I think there's such complexity around all these issues, and I don't think they're Muslim issues. I think they're people issues. I think the Sunni Shia thing is uh, an issue of tribalism, just like the Catholic Protestant. Thing or whatever, and I, I just remember being told as a child that I was a Sunni Muslim, and I just suddenly I was expected to hate Shias. I, I, you know, I remember I don't remember who, tell, who told me this, but there was some adult or some other uh, older child who, who was telling me that you're this type of person, you must hate that type of person. And you know, I'm quite pessimistic, I don't know how we overcome that, except I, I think I'm, I'm going to sound naive and idealistic, but. Clearly there's a war of ideas, and that some ideas have prospered while, while others have fallen to the wayside. And um, Kenan's experiences mirror mine. I, I grew up and I, I cared passionately about anti-racism. Uh, I had problems with the police, um, and I, I was poor. And I, I, I thought that I would grow up and, and care about those things, and that the people alongside me would care about those things. But, in, instead, that's not what we care about. We care about uh, our, our identity as Muslims. And that, that's another thing I think Kenan touched on. I never thought of myself as a Muslim. You know, I, I thought of myself as a, a, a Bangladeshi because I was constantly reminded that I was a Paki. 
you know. So I, I knew that I was a Bangladeshi. I knew that's how the world viewed me. And then something strange has happened where people from my community, or what I, what I think of as my community, have turned around and said to the world, we're, we're Muslims. And, and uh, that label Muslim has come to the fore. That identity has come to the fore for lots of people. Um, and we all have different identities at different times. But I think we as humanists need to think about why it is that so many Muslims feel that it is their Muslim identity that is first and foremost presented to the world. Um, and and we're, we're all playing a role in that. There's complex interactions. And I, I don't really have anything to say, except that I do believe that humanist values um, can help. I think I've, I've joined a movement. I've never really joined. Actually, it's a lie. I used to be a Lib Dem councillor. Um, <laughs> oh, for my sins, yeah. I was involved in politics as a young man. and. Uh, uh, I've left the Lib Dems, Marjid, maybe you should take a note. But um, um, I, I've left the Lib Dems and now I'm, I'm a committed humanist because, you know, to, to, to end my ranting on a positive note, I do believe that humanist values, if we can spread those and share those, then we will make a difference. And I, I don't know how we do that, but I suspect it, it's not through uh, ranting on the internet and stuff. I suspect it's through uh, writing better stories um, making music, making films through art and culture. I think art and culture have tremendous power to influence people. Uh, and um, I hope that humanism spreads. And, and we're lucky here to have people from Bangladesh, Pakistan, who, who are doing their bit. And I, the, the thing I'm taking away from this conference, I'm gonna go away and think, how do I support those people? How do I support, instead of attacking people, how do I support the people doing the work to, to make the change? Uh, now, we have five minutes, just under five minutes to go, so I'm afraid I have to go by the people I've already promised to give questions to. It so happens that there are three in the front. I'm not being, I'm not sort of discriminating against those at the back, but keep the questions quick and only one pan address, if you can, your questions to one of the panellists so we get a quick answer as well. Keep going. Um, you touched on um, the effect of the media and the way that they report certain things in quite a skewed manner sometimes, on like, the way it feeds into the prejudiced views of people um, in this country about Muslims as a whole. What do you think we can do about the way that the media represents certain things without curtailing the, the, the freedom of speech of the media? I don't think there's a freedom of speech issue. I think it's an issue with an irresponsible press, a lazy press. I mean, the, the gentleman Majid was talking about was the go-to Muslim. <laughs> because he was willing to appear on any radio show, television show. You could phone him up and he'd appear and it'd be a rent of bob, right? And I think it's pathetic that journalists cannot go on the internet, do some Googling, uh, and come up with people like Osama Hassan, who works for Quilliam, Sarah Khan, who's a British Muslim feminist. There's countless people of Muslim origin who still identify as Muslims, who, who share our values, liberal values, um, who, who could be speaking on behalf of Muslims. And I, I think there is an agenda. It, it seems to me there is an agenda that, that the press want to represent Muslims in a particular way, so those are the stories they, they um, report. What can we do as humanists? We can be a bit more sceptical. Thank you. Okay, so gentlemen there, if you could address it to one of the other three panelists, I'd much appreciate it. Just to... I'm sorry. <laughs> keep, keep talking, it'll, it'll come off. Uh, um, yeah. Actually, it was for you. For me? Yeah. Oh, okay. As well as Alon and the others. Okay. Uh, if the extremists are pulling us apart, uh, they'll be, they'll be all these races apart from the West and whatever, uh, wouldn't it be best to think about a way of getting them back together again? Um, and wouldn't it therefore be better to um, go back to a time when perhaps we thought a little bit alike? And I'm referring, of course, uh, to the period of history where is Islamic science was the best in the world. Uh, they led the world. And what my question really is, quickly, um, is science a force for peace? Oh, that's <laughs> well. I, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend we go back a thousand years and, and, and ask people to sort of live by the sort of worldview they had then. But there was what you can do is remind certainly the younger generation of the Islamic world that they have something to be proud of. That science is not a Western construct. Rational thinking, freedom of thinking scientifically. Uh, is, is something that has, 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 has doesn't you know, transcends cultural and religious boundaries. So a sense of pride in in their achievements may help. Uh, but I, I, you know, science is. Uh, I mean, these are bigger problems than 
just, you know, a physicist going along and saying, everyone think rationally, isn't the universe wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it may help, it may help. Alan, did you want to say quickly, quickly that? Um, it's not just size, I think it's education in general. I, I think if we can, um, as I said, support the, the likes of the young, young people we heard earlier, trying to get women in particular educators and so forth. I think education, not just science in particular. Uh, I was thinking about science values. Class value, yes, okay. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, criticizing Islamism as the fascism of our area is not attacking people. It's in fact defending people against the fascists. What we need today is an anti-fascist league, one that is as vehemently against the far right, like the BNP, like the EDL, as it is against ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Republic of Iran. There are more Muslims who will be in that league than anybody else, because the reality is as I've said before, as um, Majid also mentioned, is the fact that Muslims, or those perceived to be Muslims, are the first victims and at the forefront of this resistance. But we need to also, most importantly, defend secularism, the separation of religion from the state, because that is where people will start being able to speak and think as they want without ISIS telling them what they must think and without chopping the heads off of people who disagree with them. Thank you. Very quick final question, hopefully to Marjorie or Kenan. Uh, maybe not much of a question, but I turned it into a question. It's for Adam. Um, oh. <laughs> it has to be for Kenan. It has to be for Kenan. <laughs> okay. But the thing is, okay, I'm going to make it very brief, to the point. When you spoke, you reminded me of your political allies, uh, and they are uh, the so called moderate Islamists of the Islamic regime of Iran. Uh, people like Khatami, people like Rouhani, who are responsible for, I mean, unbelievable crimes against people of Iran. When they speak about Islam, when they speak about culture, mm -hmm. when they speak about, I mean, those values and all, they speak just like you about Islam. Honestly, they do. And I think, uh, the thing is, look, and, and other things, you, I mean, you, you you start talking about racism, you start talking about, I don't know, people's culture, and I know everybody think of nice curry. and the neighborhood they don't want to be. Sorry, is there a, a question? A question. We yes, need a quick question. The question is, haven't you mixed up uh, kind of the desire for Kai and respect for Islam together? <laughs> is, that, is that okay? Um, I, well, you, I, 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 I put you on the spot to try and make up a question, know. and it may not have come out as. as <laughs> I think. I think. You know, that's my question. Anyway. Well, well, you don't even have to ask the question. Well, well, I, 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 I want to defend a lot on this. Um, but I, I think that you'll be very unfair um, if you look along And I think it's, it's an important point he makes, which is that there is a tendency, uh, because of um, uh, dislike of Islam, hatred of Islam, to, 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 to go over from a dislike of Islam, a legitimate dislike of Islam, legitimate criticism of Islam, mm. to dislike, hatred, discrimination against Muslims uh, as well. And I think that that is really, really important to keep that because, because um, that, that line is, is, is breached all the time. And that's the point, as, as I understand it, that Alon was making. And I think it's really important uh, to recognize that. Um, can you just say two very quick points? Very, very, very quick points. On Bangladesh, it's, um, it's, it's interesting, again, the, the kind of historical shift. You know, when Bangladesh uh, became independent, it fought a war against religion, in, in, in essence, in, in, in defense of, of, of a secular state against um, West Pakistan. So the idea that Bangladeshis are now, you know, the, the Tower Hamlet is the most, uh, in, in the heart of Islam in, in, in London, shows how much things have changed over the past half century. Um, finally, just on Islamism, it seems to me one of the attractions of Islamism is that it allows um, people both a sense of tribalism, kind of narrow parochial identity, and a sense of a global identity, it kind of brings it together in a way that almost nothing else does, and, and it allows, therefore, a vent for their anger, uh, uh, a sense of tribalism, and a notion of being part of a kind of a, a global gang, if you like, and, 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 and that's part of its attraction. May I respond? Uh, we, are, we are completely running over. Can you do one sentence, one sentence, or I'll shut you up? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, the thing is that, you know, 
there has been statements uh, equating criticism of Islam with attacking people. And I think that looks at it from a very Western perspective. The reality is that a large number of people living under Islamic rule criticize Islam worse than you've ever heard. And in a sense, that criticism is necessary. You cannot have an enlightenment against Islamism without being able to criticize its banner. So stop trying to tell us how to speak properly and what limits to speak within and allow for unequivocal criticism of Islam at the same time an unequivocal uh, defense of anyone, irrespective of their background and beliefs. We have to allow for space for freedom of expression, including expression that you don't like, because we need to be able to criticize Islam, and we need to criticize it unconditionally. Hello. Uh, I'm going to plug my book again. I've written an entire book that is critical of Islam, first. I think that should be put all in mind. And uh, this is a conference about freedom of expression. You can express whatever views you like, but as people have pointed out, the expression of your views have consequences. And if one of the consequences of your view, of your, your expression of your views is that there is hatred and intolerance of other human beings, I'm just simply suggesting that you, you consider how you express your views. I think the term Islamophobia is indeed problematic, and perhaps I should have used the term anti-Muslim bigotry. Yes. However, I find it, I find it astonishing and, and, and fantastic, in fact, that we're at a conference on freedom of expression and an audience member can accuse me of being like a fascist politician. It's fantastic. I'm glad to be at this conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, a wide spectrum of views. We've run out of to where five minutes late. I hate overrunning. Uh, the next session starts at, uh, at four o'clock, Henry. Please, before you go, join me once again in thanking our panelists. Majid Nawaz, Paul Rodney, Alan